to see my new Jerusalem. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I'm going to see my Savior and walk on streets of gold. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I'm going to see my Savior and walk on streets of gold. I'm going to see my new Jerusalem. I am reaching to the highest point of praise. I'm reaching to the highest point of praise. Singing in the Spirit with perfect harmony. I am reaching to the highest point of praise. I am reaching to to the highest point of praise. Sing it in the spirit with perfect harmony. I am reaching to the highest point of praise. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. Our voices join together, each one throughout the earth. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. Our voices join together, each one throughout the earth. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The pearly gates are always open. Open all the time, heaven is filled with God's holy, pure light. The saints and angels singing praises to the King. The pearly gates are always open all the time. The pearly gates are always open, open all the time. Heaven is filled with God's holy, pure light. The saints and angels singing. Praises to the King, the pearly gates are always open all the time. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I'm going to see my new Jerusalem. I'm going to see my Savior walk on streets of gold. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I'm going to see my Savior walk the streets of gold. I am going to see my new Jerusalem. I am reaching to the highest point of praise. I am reaching to the highest point of praise. Singing in His Spirit with perfect harmony, I am reaching to the highest point of praise. I am reaching to the highest point of praise. I'm reaching to the highest point of praise. Singing in His Spirit with perfect harmony, I'm reaching to the highest point of praise. The voice and the the saints exalt the Lord. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. Our voices join together, each one throughout the earth. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The voices join together, each one throughout the earth. The voices of the saints exalt the Lord. The pearly gates are always open, open all the time. Heaven is filled with God's holy pure light. The saints and angels singing praises to the King. The pearly gates are always open all the time. The pearly gates are always open, open all the time. Heaven is filled with God's holy the saints and angels singing praises to the king the pearly gates are always open all the time amen
Well, thank the Lord for those that reach unto a higher point of praise. Amen. Knowing that the Spirit is with us and in us and for us. In Jesus' name, thank the Lord. Coming from the place where the pearly gates are always open all the time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that he is good to us and that he is near to us. Bless the Lord's holy name as uh, we gather together in matters of prayer and, of course, in worship. Uh, This comes from Sister Bev Yant for uh, daughter-in-law Annette. There's a matter of prayer, a recurrence of illness uh, that needs uh, attention immediately, so we just pray that the Lord's healing presence will be with Annette and also for Sister Bev, for granddaughter Rebecca. Uh, There's a physical need uh, that's potentially serious. Tests are undergoing, but thank the Lord for Lord's presence. He has to be our healer, has to be our deliverance. Faith has to lift us up in Jesus' name. So we're just praying along with Sister Bev and family for Annette and for her granddaughter Rebecca. Also, in Brother Dan, Sister Miriam, uh, for son Troy, who has a a troubling diagnosis and has to undergo uh, matters of tests and so forth. But we thank the Lord. As you know, Troy's a person of faith, so we just pray that faith will have its perfect work in that. And uh, praying along with uh, Brother Joe, just remember Brother Joe here, is here with us on the platform, but for an eye condition, You know, the aging process, it has consequences, but the Lord has to be our help. Thank you, Jesus. And also remember remember Sister Rosie, there's a matter of physical need for pain, but she is also uh, traveling uh, back and forth this weekend. So uh, just to be with uh, Sister Rosie on the the there and back and and with her mother for Laura there. Uh, Sister Sherry has an ongoing need for her health as well, so we're just uh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that he's in us and with us this yeah. day. We just yeah. give him all the glory, honor, and praise, you, knowing that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly Amen. above all that we ask or think in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to pray and dedicate this service to the Lord. Thank him that he is with us. Father, as we come before you in the spirit of worship and spirit of truth, we yes. thank you, Lord, that your light shines upon us. Father, we thank you for the given word, and we thank you for the gift of life that we've been given. And we thank you for the word that expresses the truth of God that's been within you from eternity, Father. Lord, just bless this word to us now. Put it into our hearts, into our beings, so that we can draw nearer to you, Father, nearer to the throne of grace. And for these prayer requests for... Uh, in the Yant family, and the Millhouse family, for uh, Rebecca, for Annette. Father, we just pray that your mercy will show there, Lord, and that the faith within that seed that you have planted, it will sprout and bring forth fruit abundantly, Father. We just thank you, dear Lord, for your eternal presence to be uh, amongst these, for, for Troy, Hunter, and the the diagnosis and the treatment thereof, thanking you, Lord, that there's always hope in you. What a blessed hope we have. What an assurance of faith we have in Jesus' name that's real, that's active, and working in people's lives. Father God, and for others mentioned, Brother Joe, Sister Sherry, Sister Rosie, and uh, the travels, and Father God, Brother Wayne, Sister Rhonda, also traveling some today. So, Father, we just thank you, dear Lord, for being with them, being with us every step of the way in Jesus' name. It's one more day to worship the Lord. It's one more step of faith along this pilgrimage pathway that we go upon. So, Lord, just be with us this day. May this servants, this service just be to the furtherance of the kingdom of glory and to the glory of your name, Lord. Let your life dwell within us in Jesus' name. We pray all these things to be. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that he is near us and that his presence is great. So we're going to sing, Great is the Lord. Amen. Great is the Lord. What a vision. Thank you, Lord.
in the mountain of his holiness beautiful the joy of all the earth is mount zion's holy hill our lord is greater still as is thy name mountain of his holiness great is the lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our god in the mountain of his holiness joy of all the earth is Mount Zion's holy hill. Our Lord is greater still, as is thy name, O God. So is thy praise in all Great is his name. Great is the Lord. Father, he is worthy to be praised. Name above all names. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. Well, blessed Lord. Amen. I think we need to see some dark clouds get parted. So if you pray for me, I'll pray for you. We're getting some rays of hope to shine through in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Bless his holy name. Lord, be with us this day. Thank the Lord. Amen. You pray for me and I'll pray for you. Amen. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. We'll watch the dark clouds go away. Slate the love shine true. Take it to the Father. He knows just what to do. Pray for me. Dark clouds roll away, as rays of love shine through. We'll take it to the Father, He knows just what to do. Pray for me, God, pray for you. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you. We'll watch the dark clouds roll away, as rays of love shine through. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. We'll watch the dark clouds roll away as rays of love shine through. We'll take it to the Father, He'll know just what to do. Pray for me and Dark clouds be gone in Amen. Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank the Lord for each and every one of you that's gathered together in Jesus' name this Thank day. You, We're going to turn the service over to Brother Bill as the praise goes on. Amen. According to the will of the Lord. Brother Bill. God bless you, Brother Ryan. God bless everyone this morning. We'll get right into the specials. And us brothers will sing, Love Lifted Me. Thank you, Lord. Love lifted me. Love lifted. 
it be when nothing else could help love lift it me love lift it me love lift it me when nothing else could help From the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. my soul's best songs, faithful loving service to, to him. help love lifted me souls in danger look above Jesus completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be be saved today love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help God bless your brothers and sister Miriam. For our next election, Sister Margo will sing for us, When You Sow the Wind.
when you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end is the way of death. You can't do your own thing and also do God's perfect will. Cause when you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. A sincere heart without obedience won't have sway on judgment day. The things you say and do are judged according to God's word. Cause when you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. The whirlwind is furious and evil. Over it, you have no control. The time has come for God's vengeance. You're gonna reap the flesh you have sown. Cause when you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. You've hardened your heart to God's message. Now you're deluded to believe a lie. You've given heed to seducing spirits. You're bound with tears, and by the sword you must die. Cause when you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. Oh, hearken to the minister of God, for he beareth not his sword in vain. It's a sharp two-edged sword of the word, but evil do should be afraid cause when you sow the wind you're going to reap the whirlwind the whirlwind also bears a sword that tears like the gnashing of teeth the torment and agony unbearable the sword of the whirlwind brings certain death Cause when you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. With your lips you delight to draw near, but in your heart you love not the word. You've rejected and stumbled at that stone, now it will fall and grind you to powder. Cause when you sow the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. Yes, when you sow the wind, you've got to reap the whirlwind. But follow the voice of God's Spirit, that still small voice saying, here is a way. Come up hither, come out this day. His Spirit will lead you and guide you. You're seated in heavenly places, so live the fullness of God's faith in you, and know his written word is true, that's wisdom according to knowledge, and follow the voice of the Spirit, that still small voice saying, here's a way, come up hither, come out this day, his Spirit will lead you and guide you. Beautiful, Sister Marvel. God bless you for that. Amen. For the next selection, we'll sing this Jesus that's called Christ, and let's do God's perfect will. He is the chief cornerstone of our foundation of love. He is the great I am. He is the Father. He is the Son, the Holy Ghost. 
He is the Lord Jesus Christ Who walked upon the earth in the form of a man
perfect place. Those that are predestined will hear the Spirit's call. They'll put down fleshly creeds of man and listen to God's plan. Listen, my dear brethren, are you ready to meet the Lord? To meet that marriage supper up in glory land? Let's do God's will, His perfect will, and stand up on His word and have the revelation. Knowing he has brought us into this perfect place. Let's do God's will, his perfect will, and stand up on his word and have the revelation for our day and age. Let's be in perfect harmony. Before his blessed face, knowing he has brought us into this perfect place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, brothers and sisters. It's good to sing, sing those songs of the ones that have gone before us. Amen. God bless you. Father. Last selection, Sister Patty and Sister Rachel will sing for us, The Blood.
God bless you, sisters and Sister Miriam. We'll all stand before Pastor Ryan comes to bring forth the word of truth to us. You know, the nails were real. The scourging that Christ took for us was real. And the blood flowed on that cross for you and me. And the scripture also speaks in Leviticus that the life 
of all flesh is in the blood the life. Christ is the life that's in the blood. And when his royal blood flows through your veins, there's no disease or sickness or illness that can hold you captive and torment you anymore because God has set you free by the shedding of his blood. And it's flowing out today. We're going to sing this chorus. The blood is flowing out from the mercy seat of God because there's mercy in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Blood is flowing out from the mercy seat of God. There is mercy in the name of the Lord. Renew your mind, body, and soul with the blood of Jesus Christ. And this mercy lasts forever and ever. Just accept this mercy now. It will rid you of all demons so the joy of the Lord can flood your soul. Oh, the blood is flowing out from the mercy seat of God. There is mercy in the name of the Lord. Renew your mind, body, and soul with the blood of Jesus Christ. For this mercy lasts forever and ever. Just accept this mercy now, it will rid you of all demons, so the joy of the Lord can flood your soul. Oh, the blood is flowing out from the mercy seat of God, there is mercy in the name of the Lord. Renew your mind, body, and soul with the blood of Jesus Christ, for this mercy lasts forever and ever. Just accept this mercy now, it will rid you of all demons, so the joy of the Lord can flood your soul. The blood is flowing out from the mercy seat of God, there is mercy in the name of the Lord. Renew your mind, body, and soul with the blood of Jesus Christ, for this mercy lasts forever and ever. Accept this mercy now, it will rid you of all demons, so the joy of the Lord can flood your soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. the Lord. You know, the Lord promised he wouldn't destroy the world again by flood, but he did promise to flood your soul. Amen. amen. With the word of God. So, amen. Amen. So blessed Lord, as we think on his holy name and as we bow our heads and give reverence unto the King of glory, Sister Mary may play through as she will. Father, we just thank you, dear Lord, for your mercy that does indeed endure forever. Father, that same mercy that rejoices against judgment in the days of the darkened sun and the blood redness of the moon. Father, even then, those that call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you hear the righteous cry. Father, attend unto our prayers as we give you all the honor and glory and the praise. For it is due you to he who alone is worthy to be praised. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for all your benevolent mercies that you shed round about us and for the gift of life that's in the blood. Father, that soul that you put within, Lord, may it just bear fruit, Father, as we reach up unto the heavens, Father, and seek the help from Zion's hills. Father, we thank you for your blessed word. Through the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen and glory. Well, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that our God is indeed with us. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. Well, blessed Lord, he's near to us. Amen. Thank the Lord. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, back in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, it was a call off the altar that purged the iniquity of, of the prophet. You know what that was? That was the blood of Jesus in prophetic terms. Amen. 
That was prophetic terms, amen, that speaks of the blood which was to come. So thank the Lord because the blood of Jesus, it's like a burning coal off the altar of righteousness from heaven. Amen. So this day as we think on these things, we think on, think on the things that God has spoken as he's put all creation in place from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof as uh, the earth rotates upon its axis to make that so. It's marvelous what we see around us and it's evidence of what God has done. The natural creation is that one sun in the sky. It's, it's a great witness of the spiritual true, true light uh, showing us that the day star above, uh, through the light of it, that which we refer to as the sun, it just gives testament to the fact that there's one God. And one day we'll have no need for uh, any other light sources other than the Spirit of the Lord himself. For God, who is light, will shine in the kingdom which is to come in Revelation 22 and verse 5. Oh, happy day that will be. Amen. Thank the Lord. But we see it now prophetically. And when it's conceived in the mind of Almighty God, because God's been putting it together the plan of glory from before our beginnings, from before Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, conceived in the mind of Almighty God and then inspired to the prophets and written, which makes it a done deal in Jesus' name. So those are the types of things that we constantly affirm as we uh, should put them foremost in the front of our thought processes uh, to consider what God has done, what he is doing right now, and what he will do in a decidedly imperfect world that we inhabit in the here and now. Uh, we seek better, we seek something that's better to come. That land of promise where one day all tears will be wiped away. Well. You know, there's a lot of critics of that. Why couldn't have God just created a better place, uh, a perfect place, you know, at the first? Well, he did. It's the place prepared. It's called heaven. We're making our way there. We're on our pilgrimage right now. Just takes a little patience, takes a little perseverance along the highway of faith. But we consider all those things and let that then be in the words of our two-word title, perfectly considered. Let's perfectly consider these things that are getting us closer to the throne of God. Of God. Glad to hear uh, the song that Brother Dean was inspired to write so many years ago. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But uh, this is that which leads you to the perfect place. So we're going to perfectly consider these things. And if we consider Christ, well, you want to do it in a perfect way, right? You want to be in his will. That makes all kinds of spiritual sense. Uh, no one wants to be wrong in their considerations of Christ. And we seek eternal truth in all matters of prophecy and doctrine, uh, in all considerations. There are many who seek Christ in uh, their own way, but it has to be the provided pathway uh, that leads us to the cross. So think on him with the heart and soul of who you are, and you can find the way. As Nathaniel of St. John chapter 1, I refer to him often, the Israelite without guile, who had no desire within himself except that which looks for the promise of the Messiah, and to seek the peace and the consolation of Israel. That was his whole purpose in life, foremost among the uh, many other things that a person will have in their life. But that was foremost among them, whereby he becomes an example to us of faithfulness, whether from the Gentile house of faith or whether uh, of Jewish extraction. But he had no ulterior motive other than to be found squarely within God's will. And that was instinctive to him. He lived by thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he did that before Jesus uttered those words within the Lord's prayer. 
during their early days, just as Jesus started uh, to preach after the repentance gospel of John the Baptist. But he was walking that way already. It was in his heart. So when he heard those words of the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven, he was already there. He was there by faith instinct. He had perfectly considered faith, which gave him sight. For he said upon hearing Jesus say, uh, Before I, I saw you under the fig tree, before they'd even met face to face, and uh, as uh, he asked, you know, how knowest thou me? And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. And uh, the corresponding verses that close out the chapter, uh, no doubt Nathaniel was thinking of the promise of Jacob's ladder and that which reaches unto Christ. And here Christ had come down. Here he is in a body of flesh. But he was focused on Christ from that point onward. And Christ then becomes the center and the point of everything from creation and from the advent of man. And lo and behold, Nathaniel there, he got to see the coming of the message of the Messiah firsthand and up close. So everything that we see around us, and uh, from the written word we read from, it was pointing towards Emmanuel. The object of all that was written in the prophets and in the law books of Moses, which contain prophetic account within them, but from the law and the prophets, everything we read, it was pointing toward Emmanuel. Our God is with us, the promised one of Isaiah 7, 14, which uh, Matthew 20, uh, 121, or verse 23 rather, it verifies those things, the promise of the Messiah, and those things having a, a the prophet Isaiah in 714, since I referred to it specifically, that had a fulfillment in Isaiah's own day, but it had much greater and broader meaning prophetically in Christ and to the birth of Jesus. So, Isaiah being the prophet of the Messiah and the whole work proclaims it within the symbology of scripture and the metaphor language, the parallels, the types and the visions, some very direct, uh, of the Messiah's coming, but they're all taken together. It forms a picture of the mindset of the Almighty God, as Scripture has compound meaning within it. And the, the example I use most often in that respect is Hosea 11.1, in and that I called my son out of Egypt, which historically is a reference to the Exodus generation. But prophetically, it speaks to the coming of Joseph and Mary, bringing the young Jesus out of exile in Egypt after the death of Herod, as they came out of Egypt there. So the Bible, it's not always written in a way that mankind, you know, literary examples and rules of literature and so forth. The Bible's not always written in the way that mankind perceives things. As a matter of fact, it never is. It's on a higher level than all those things. It thinks in a deeper way. It thinks in a revelation way as it reveals itself to us as we go on and we get deeper into it. It's inspirations just of a different sort. So we have to take that into our perfect considerations to always look for a witness of Christ in the line and pawn line and the precept upon precept and the here a little and there a little gospel that we live by as it's inspired of God. The whole, uh, you can't just take it as a, and you can't study the Bible like you do a science book. It's just written on a different level. It's different inspiration. And uh, it's given to human beings, the word of God was through apostles and prophets. And we of the human creation, we're fallible. We're very human. So were those who were inspired to write the word. And examples of, of that, they're so numerous that you can't mention them all. But through the prophets and apostles, we find the balance. We find the balance of things by comparison, which uh, is, is contained in the double witness doctrine of scripture, where we come to the truth of the matter. 
because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established, as written in the law of Moses and Jesus drew upon it in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 16. So by many scriptures, we compare and contrast in order that we can get centered upon God's will and learn what it is that he would have us to know in Jesus' name. It's God's strength, it will always show from the reinforcements of scripture in order that we don't misinterpret. Now, the Bible has been the most misinterpreted book in the history of books. Uh, but all, along the way, the system is built within the scriptures so that we can compare and contrast so that we don't misinterpret any single verse's meaning. Or there's ample light to get on a better pathway if at first we don't understand. And that's a continual walk. That's a continual pilgrimage of faith. But revelation knowledge will see us through. We have the two basics that we proceed from in the love of God, the hero Israel commandment. He is one Lord, and to love him with all that you have and serve him is the greatest of all commandments, and then accordingly to love one another. And we proceed from there. And nothing in, is true in Scripture unless God makes it true. But he will confirm his word and bring it to pass. All right, 2 Timothy. For scripture reference, it'll be 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> the Bible's written in proportion to achieve great truths, to achieve all the things that are written therein. It'll get you to know the name of Jesus. And what's that do? It does a perfect work because it, because it saves your soul and puts you in heaven. And that's perfect. You can't, that's what it was designed to do. So people have, you know, I know that not everybody's out there looking for criticisms of the Bible. We're people of faith. But so many that do, they're looking at it through the wrong way, you know, and they pick on things, you know, this isn't perfect, that isn't perfect. God's standard of perfection is that which saves the soul, gets you to know the name of Jesus, and puts you in heaven. And the, all, all the rest becomes a matter of revelation and it it's continually shows itself, and God confirms his word, and that is, that's a perfect work. That is perfect. It's not perfect the way mankind defines it. It's perfect the way that God defines it, and many doctrines attend to that. But all of it pertains to everlasting life, and life comes from God. It was so in the beginning, or otherwise there wouldn't be a beginning. It was so in the beginning, and it is right now, and always will be. All right, 2 Timothy, the chapter is 3, and we'll read from verse 14 in this encouragement. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. See, perfectly considered. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, that's the wisdom from above. That's the wisdom that comes. It'll save your soul. It brings you to the salvation of the soul. Owing to this fact in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, there were many books in the ancient world. Uh, those that are within the accepted canon of scripture, which was forming right about the time the New Testament church came into being. Uh, these are taken together. And uh, the books that we have in, in our Bible, the law of Moses and the prophets accordingly, and uh, that which might be interpreted as the Jewish canon. There are many ancient books, but uh, they knew the best books, and those are the ones that Jesus quoted from and accepted. And you can find that through scripture. All right, so all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, in righteousness rather, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly fur furnished unto all good works. Oh, uh, the seed remains in and you can't sin in the matter of unbelief. What's in your heart, it stays there. Even in moments of discouragement or trial, it'll burn within your heart and it'll come out just like it was for the prophet Jeremiah of old. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. 
Sure, he was human. Sure, he got discouraged along the way. I, I, I'm on everybody's hit list. And I don't mean in a good way, I mean in a bad way. Uh, they seek my life. Put him in a dungeon right up to the, his nostrils in the miry clay. Became an object of derision. And he was weary within his spirit, and he said, I'm not going to speak in the name of the Lord anymore, but the fire in his heart overcame that. That Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, that I've known you, I knew you before you were even born. That, that kind of stuff was in him, and it was just going to have to come out. Despite his temporary disappointment, and through all his lamentings, and through all his sorrow. So, thank the Lord. Amen. God gives us strength. He gives us the salvation and faith through Christ Jesus that we may be perfect, perfectly forgiven in Jesus' name. For none of us is perfect in and of our own selves. But we can have a perfect standing in Jesus' name, which is the encouragement that we have. And in the last days, perilous times, they'll come. That's the first verse of chapter 3. Perilous times will indeed come. You need to know that. And the, but the, the scripture, the, the references here, they're pretty basic in outline. But the basics are always good to keep us grounded and settled because things will get crazy. The train will go off the rails at, at, at times in personal life and the situations that are around us. And that'll certainly be so in the days of to and fro that uh, the perilous times of the last days when they come, it'll certainly be so in that day. When there's all, all, the, all these things, the confusion of the hour and so forth, uh, when knowledge is greatly increased, and we see that in our day, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Uh, in such a day as that, you need the basics, to know that the word is forever settled in heaven. It's always settled in heaven. There's one God and Father above. And even though there are so many voices out there, we only have one Father above. Even if you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you've only got one Father, one God who is above all and through all and in all. Amen. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5. And that dwells within. So in, in the midst of all the, the voices, and they're not going to agree on every point of doctrine, but you have a word that makes you grounded and settled in heaven. And here's the necessity, is the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. Salvation, like many words in the English dictionary, can be used in different ways. It can be salvation, you know, if you... Uh, if you have a need of a police officer, you know, because somebody wants to hold you up at gunpoint and the, the cop car comes right by and stops right where you're at, boy, that's salvation, right, on, on, a, on that level. But ultimate salvation, that, the, the saving of the soul, that comes through Christ because that's the preservation forever of the gift that God has given. That comes through Christ alone, comes through full assurance. But we thank God for his mercy that shows. 1 Corinthians 3.15. Some have to go through judgment and have trial by fire. But yet the soul can be saved, even though it's through the fiery trial. But God's mercy, it endures forever. But these things taken together, they're, they're great steps unto perfect consideration as we read them out of 2 Timothy, which gives us the building blocks of all the glory which is to follow. As perfection here, it's intended to, in the use uh, in order to convey that you have what's needed. You have what's necessary. God has given us all things. He's given us of his life. He's given us all blessings that we might be fully equipped for the task that is at hand. And that's, and that's perfect. That is a perfect work. In, in 1 Corinthians... 1 Corinthians, this will be chapter 2, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth there on the Greek peninsula as the word of God began to spread out to the nations. God has a perfect plan for you to give you life forevermore. 
and place you into the very perfection of beauty. I love that phrase. I say it so many times. Not just a place that is beautiful, but is the very perfection of beauty that Psalms 50 describes the heavenly Zion as. Because we need a better place. We need a higher place. We need a higher point of praise. If you're going to have a higher point of praise, you need a higher place to give forth a higher point of praise, right? So we're seeking that in the new heavens and the new earth. And if the word puts you there, well, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's as good as you can get. It's what God designed. And he did, did so and does so even now by using human beings who are decidedly imperfect, but he's getting us to a perfect place of praise, being perfectly forgiven in his name. And that will show in the mindset of the Almighty God here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's start reading out at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, and boy, that one's out there. That one's out there. And it's getting worse all the time. Uh, the signs of the times, there's so much deceit in the world. There's uh, people going this way for all, this way and that way for all types of reasons out in the spirit of the world. Uh, but we haven't received that, but rather the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. I want a perfect gift. And you know what I want? want the price of it to be? I want it to be free. Amen. I want it to be the free gift. Now that's perfect. When you get the gift of life and you get it free, that's perfect. Amen. So the things that we receive, they're freely given from God's mercy, His grace, which is God's mercy freely given. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, and we do have it through printed page, through the red letter words of Jesus, and through the black letter words that support the gospel as we hold up the light of the gospel. All these things, they're perfectly considered. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual in verse 13. That, that's the double witness doctrine I alluded to earlier. That's, that's, it, that's in actual practice because you're comparing spiritual things to spiritual. It's the way prepared for that I hasn't seen yet through Christ, which is verse nine of this very uh, chapter, as I use that in scripture so often, which is based upon the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 64 and verse four. So to have the mind of Christ is to be perfect. So how, how can we do that? We who are beset by the weaknesses uh, through the battleground of the mind that Romans chapter 7 details uh, so specifically, how can we uh, have the mind of Christ even when, uh, you know, because the flesh is weak, even when the spirit is willing? Well, we have Christ's mind put out by word for us here. Conceived in the almighty inspired to the prophets, and then again, when it's written, that's a finished work. It does what it says it will do. It leads us to salvation, copied out over the centuries and then printed. Uh, it's an entire picture of what God has thought upon, what he's revealed, and what he fulfills from coming from the source of all things, from he who was and is and is to come and judges all matters faithfully, which is not a violation of Matthew 7, 1. Uh, judge not that you be not judged. You have to make all sorts of considerations in your life. You have to decide between what's light and darkness. You have to decide between right and wrong, between good and evil, between matters of life and death. 
But Matthew 7, 1, that refers to we don't judge people as to the content of their soul and the miracle of God's salvation. If, if, we did, if they did that, we'd never have the account of the Roman centurion who was out of the Roman enemy of that time. There's a reason why Jesus said love your enemies because sometimes somebody will come out of there who has some faith and some love within that'll bring the great miracles, amen. One who understands authority. So thank the Lord for those things. God just thinks on a higher level. So we judge people, we don't judge people as according to their spiritual worth or question their salvation. We don't do that. But in all matters, the judgments that we have to make of spiritual things, well, you have to choose between uh, truth and deceit. You have to decide those things. You have to decide what is God's will and what is not his will. You're responsible to work out your salvation in fear and in trembling. And to perfectly consider all things, you need the words of Jesus. You need his words. They have, who's, who's written a better book than the Bible? Who's improved upon the words of Jesus in the last 2,000 years? Nobody that I'm aware of. You can go into bookstores and find a lot of books about the Bible, but what you really need is the Bible, amen, amen which teaches us the ways of life. So perfectly consider all these things. You need his testimony, which the spirit of prophecy is, and it's all written within the word of God. Signified, sent, and verified by many spiritual truths and by the word coming to pass. In 2 Peter chapter 1, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. The witness of Jesus is in here. It's a, uh, from Revelation 19.10. Remember the angel speaks to John the apostle revelator. Tells him that the testimony of Jesus is contained within the spirit of prophecy. It's pretty amazing, you know, when you think about it. When we give a, a, a testimony like here at church, it's a, about something that God has done for you. The testimony of Jesus is about what he's going to do for you. Amen. As he looks into the future, sees things from a different vantage point, it tells you what he's going to do as well as what was and what is right now at the moment. But the testimony of Jesus tells you what will be, what he will do Amen. in prophetic terms. God knows how to inspire us. That's inspiring. Amen. We have a source that tells us not only what was and what is, but that which will be. All right. So thank the Lord. Here in 2 Peter chapter 1, we're reading from the 19th verse, which says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Well, thank the Lord for the light that shines amidst the darkness. Thank the Lord that the light can shine in this Laodicean age, whether we're on the last edges of it and what the time frame is, I can't exactly say. But uh, thank the Lord for those that uphold the light of the gospel. It's shining in a dark day. It's growing darker by the moment. Until that blessed day when the day dawn, as it says here. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Oh, the sun's coming up. In my soul, Lord, in my soul. Till the day star arise. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. We can't think of ourselves more than we ought. We're learning. We know in part, we prophesy in part. God is the absolute. The word of God is the absolute. Yeah. We're making our way toward that. We're going the perfect way so that we can be perfectly forgiven and perfectly lifted up in order that we can be in the perfect place, the very perfection of beauty, that the new heavens and the new earth contains within the city of the Zion which is to come. For the prophecy, I'm at verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, 
but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Well, blessed Lord, blessed Lord, the testimony of Jesus is there. And holy men, that's in relative terms. Our holiness, like Isaiah the prophet, who said, I'm a man of unclean lips, I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. We're not holy of ourselves, but it's relative terminology. Those that hold up the faith of Jesus, amen, and receive inspiration by the Holy Spirit, they're covered. They're covered. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, shown in prophetic terms by the coal off the altar, because that's the life of Christ. Another, there's nothing except the blood. There's nothing but the life of Christ that can wash away sins. That's why I know that that coal off the altar, that's a piece of the life of Christ. Come down in the Old Testament there, amen, to purge iniquity. So the advice that we read there, to take heed or to pay attention, it was vital then, it's vital now, for the gospel is exactly this, it's a light that shines in a dark place. But thank the Lord, you can't pack enough darkness into a room where the candle won't shine. Amen. When it's lit up. As a matter of fact, it'll show all the more because of the darkness. So thank the Lord. Amen. Redeem the time, as the scripture says. Make good use of it in more modern terminology. For the days are evil. And we do so by entering, you know, this point. You know, uh, some some things you notice out there, you know, they really, they gripe me. I was going to say they really gripe my cookies. I don't know if that means, in, means anything. I don't, I say that every once in a while. It's a kind of a meaningless statement, but uh, it really gripes my cookies anyway. When I see uh, some of the things that go on out there, uh, we've entered into the labors of those that, uh, have come before us. Uh, no one man uh, uh, comes to knowledge of the gospel unless they're centered on Christ, you know. And if they're, when you look through, a, there's so much, you know, about Brother Branham, whose course we follow because he followed Christ. There's so much out there written in criticism and, and uh, so forth, you know. If there would have been internet at the time of Christ, you'd be reading the same kinds of stuff. Uh, about that. There would have been, and indeed uh, at the time that proves out because Christ ended up upon the cross. So there's uh, so much criticism out there and some of that is because some have made Brother Branham an idol in their worship and so forth, which is a reproach upon the whole body of Christianity and Brother Branham himself wouldn't have anything to do with that. But uh, uh, Jesus would have been called a false prophet on Twitter or whatever, you know, social media there is, and uh, had that been the case in, in that day. It all ends up on the cross. So don't worry about the criticisms and things of this world. Amen. We've got a more sure word, which is, uh, amen, the word that comes from the ancient of days, eh, it, it's unimproved upon. You know, what's the value of that? What's the value? You know, people put antique values on things. What's the value, uh, the antique value, so to speak, on that which is even before the beginning of time? It's in the words that Jesus spoke. That's the value that we seek, because this stuff is forever. These ancient words, they're greater. They can be had without money, without price. Go out there and buy a Rembrandt or a Monet or something like that. It's going to cost you big time. We're buying eternal life without money, without price. It's more valuable than all the gold of this world. You can go in a dollar store, buy a, a cheap Bible, and the pages might smear, and the ink might not be very good. The binding might fall apart. If you use it the way you should, it better. <laughs> But it's the most valuable thing that there is. It's greater than all else. This stuff, it's eternal. It's the wisdom that was there before the worlds were framed. You can't put a price on that. It's a pearl of great price. You give all that you have in order to obtain it. 
because it contains God's wisdom. And wisdom was there before physical creation. It was first, because that wisdom is an eternal word. Like truth is, like love is, like faith is. There are eternal properties within wisdom, which was God's companion, which was there before the peaks and the valleys were made. It was set up from forever, from everlasting. And true wisdom comes from the very source of all light. Well, we're here in 2 Peter, just to turn forward to uh, chapter 3, and from verse 1, We'll read there, it's the Lord's companion wisdom, it was always there, set up for, from everlasting, before creation ever took hold, and that's a voice that needs to be heard. All, uh, all other voices have to be put aside in order to hear the Master's voice. That's a voice that lifts us up, it changes lives, uh, as well as creates life. It quickens us, in the King James sense, it puts life within our, life within our spirit. As wisdom is crying out to be heard, there in Proverbs chapter 8, oh, to be in the house of wisdom, the house of seven pillars, the finished perfection work of Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 1. To be in that house where it's better to be a doorkeeper than dwell in all the tents of the ungodly. There has to be another source of wisdom than other than that which comes from man to be sure. Just seek it because it's there. All right, so wisdom calls out to be heard and, and the Creator answered the call of wisdom and that's why we're all here right now in a body of flesh and have a soul within. And Peter writes, Second Peter chapter 3 from the first verse, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. And boy, are they ever out there. They're out there all over the internet. They've always been there to a degree, but the sound is so very much more amplified in our day and age because of the advances of science and so forth and the proliferation of media and uh, communications and so forth. In the last days there will come scoffers walking after their own lusts. And you know what sin is? Sin is, another word for sin is selfishness. That which is just self-centered, seeks its own desires, doesn't seek the welfare of others. That's what sin is. It wants to lift itself up above all else. In this, such a day and age, they walk after their own desires, their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Of course, it's been 2,000 years of time since those words were written. What is 2,000 years of time in the mind of the Almighty God? It's a blink of an eye. He sees from a different vantage point. But we go through this life in order to learn his word, just a little bit of godly virtue of patience is required of us along the way. It has been centuries. What are centuries to the Almighty God? He dwells beyond all that. And the value of all this that's comprehended within verse 8, uh, speaking to time, it's in this very chapter, as the Lord uh, sees a day as a thousand years, as a thousand years as one day. So Peter delivers the word, speaks to all these things, and uh, tells us of how God sees the element of time, which uh, Psalms chapter 90 and verse 4. The Psalm of Moses says, within it, that it's <clears throat> a thousand years, it's just like a watch in the night, to the Almighty God. Psalms chapter 90, it, uh, it's the only one that bears the heading as a Psalm of Moses written in scripture. Within uh, Jewish tradition, it's held that uh, Psalms 90 through 100 were, all of those Psalms were written by Moses. But the only one that has the heading attributed to it is 
uh, Psalms chapter 90, but it makes spiritual sense that the other ones were written by Moses as well. But it's the time frame and the mindset of Almighty God that we're focusing on uh, right now because that's a biblical confirmation of what we know, what Einstein figured out in 1905, took that long to figure out a few things of the Almighty God that are true. But it's confirmed of what we call the theory of relativity, which Brother Branham accepted that. He knew that the time frame was different because he knew these scriptures, knew 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, knew Psalms 90 and verse 4. So uh, truth is truth, whether fear no truth. Christians should be the biggest truth seekers instead of burying their heads in the sand and, and making the book of Genesis out to be a kindergarten story. We ought to seek for truth and find greater revelation through the revelation that God has given. All right, so now in all things, it's all pointing toward the coming of the Lord because it will come, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the nights in the same chapter here, many places in scripture, but it's in verse 10 of uh, the same chapter we just read. So be aware of the day of the Lord. Be aware of his coming because as all our salvation hope is based upon the resurrection, all our deliverance in the future hinges upon the hour of his appearance upon the hour of that second coming, when he will return to rule and reign. And there are many promises in accordance with that, many attendant promises. But these basic facts provide vision and foundation from which to proceed from. And it's all because of this, because God is merciful, and patience is a virtue. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit in the long-suffering that's spoken of. Uh, within scripture. God is patient. That's why it takes a while. So this attitude of all oh, the things are just like they've always been, nothing will ever change. It's uh, been this way all the time. God is patient. His mercy endures. It'll come forth just as every promise came forth concerning the birth of Messiah, of the Messiah. So also will these revelation prophecies come forth. But right now, we're looking at the, for the signs of the times. The iniquity of the modern day Amorites is not at the full just yet, but one day it will be, and that'll be uh, the moment when Christ will come and when the great things of prophecy will unfold. But right now, the heathen are raging, oh my yes. They're imagining vain things, things that don't have any profit spiritually, eternally. Many things are lining up. And in such words, that's come from many pulpits over thousands of years. But it's, it's been warned of it, uh, for many generations. And many, and many have cried wolf on that one. Well, the day of the Lord will be this time, it'll be that time. Uh, it'll come like a thief in the night. The world will be caught unaware. But the voice of God will get the bride prepared nonetheless. Matthew chapter 25, the wise virgins, the call comes at the unexpected hour. It's a midnight cry, but they're still prepared. Even, they didn't know the, even though they didn't know the exact moment of his appearing, they're still prepared. So we're being prepared. And uh, so we're looking toward the day of the Lord. Amen. One day the, the real wolf will be out there and the devil cast down, seeking whom he may devour, even as it is right now. In that day and age, amen, we'll need the voice of the Lord to provide us with the strength to be lifted up. Let's turn to Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah chapter 23. We're going to start at verse 18 through the words of the prophet. So we think on and consider the great prophecies, the mindset of the eternal God. How long is it? How long will it be? How long, O Lord, holy and true? Remember that was the question in that particular case of the fifth seal in the book of Revelation. Souls under the altar. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge our blood on them that dwell on earth? How long till that moment arrives? Well, all the miscalculations that many supposedly wise have spoken of 
uh, it doesn't change the eternal fact that the moment will come. The real moment will arrive. They were given white robes there, those souls under the altars. And what were they told? They were told to rest yet for a little season. Now that, that's an amazing statement on so many levels. For one thing, it's a picture of that which goes on in the eternal realm. They're given white robes. They're people who died for the word of God, but not the testimony of Jesus, Old Testament faith. They have to be given white robes. They don't have them yet. But uh, what are they told? They're told to rest yet for a little season. So even those who have passed on need patience. How about that? If that's true, how much more do we need to have patience unto the coming of the Lord? How long, O Lord, holy and true, till all these things be? Well, things are shaping up. Things are shaping up, and one day it will all come forth. But not my will, it won't be of my accord, it'll be thy will be done. Amen. You can't hurry God. But thank the Lord, amen, his word brings strength to our soul. Here in Jeremiah chapter 23, from verse 18. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. And remember the, the background of the day. The Babylonians are at the gate, Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. Jeremiah's been preaching repentance and he's being rejected and so forth. So set against the backdrop of that day, it's about uh, roughly 600 years before the birth of Jesus, before the Bethlehem birth. All right, even like a grievous whirlwind, uh, the Lord's word is gone forth. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have, per, have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. How do you consider something perfectly? Uh, again, in context, it's given to the people of that day, in the latter end of the prophetic day that was happening right now, at that time, 600 years before the Bethlehem birth, the latter days for them directly were the coming of the Babylonian hordes under Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, the word of God is just as responsible to the people of the age it's given to as it is for us along the timeline of history. But there are precepts and patterns that are written into the fabric of Scripture that speak to the future. Word speaks to us on many levels. As my most oft used example of that is Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, that uh, out of Egypt have I called my son. Uh, but yet, it, and I referred to it earlier, out of Egypt have I called my son, but it refers also to Christ being led out of Egypt in the time of his, uh, his younger years uh, by Joseph and Mary. All right, so the prophetically, it speaks of uh, many centuries that are in the future from that time, and it's a statement also to all of us in our day and age. There are levels of righteousness and prophetic witness built into the scripture. And in the latter days, our latter days, that herald the coming of the king, there will be evening time light. At evening it shall be light, see by. So who's marked his word and heard it? Who's accepted it on the spiritual level that the word of God is written by? Or in the words inspired to the seven church ages there, the seven churches of Asia Minor that represented also, it was written to them as churches that were existent right then, but it also represents the coming ages. Uh, but the injunction is, he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says, because this is a unified work. From stem to stern, from pillar to post, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, which finishes out the consummation of Scripture, it's a unified work with different men, different ages, but always the same Spirit to inspire them. 
But let's turn, just, I have one verse, be our concluding verse. It's in Luke chapter 6, it'll be verse 40. Consider everything, but not the least of things that you should consider, is a pent-up fury of the Almighty God to people who have forgotten their Creator. There will be the day of wrath, the wrath of the Lamb that was slain. For too long, the nations of the earth have not considered and they've rejected the Holy One of Israel. Well, they're going to have to consider a lot of things when the Word comes and brings itself to pass. They're going to have to consider the One who's cast down from heaven, war in heaven of Revelation 12, 7. They're going to be forced to do that who has great wrath and goes about, uh, described in that point in scripture as a red dragon, seeking whom he may devour in Revelation 12.1. Now that's a foretaste of the future. Daniel the prophet saw a little bit of it in the book of Revelation of the Old Testament. John would get more light upon it of those things that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So it's a foretaste of the future by a God who has a testimony that comes by the spirit of prophecy. We can't neglect the spirit of prophecy. It has to be held up. We can't neglect that and at the same time have perfect consideration. Got to consider these things. Got to bring them forward and speak to them because it's the witness of, of God's prophetic work. Um, as I have described the Bible many times, as my dad described it many times, the Bible is about one-third prophecy. It's about one-third doctrine. Just, this is just in general terms. It's not dogmatic. But it's roughly one-third prophecy, one-third doctrine, and one-third historical account. And the, and the spirit that is prophetic in nature, it runs throughout the, all the other portions of the book. And in thinking about, this just occurred to me this morning. This is one of these, it was right there in front of my face the whole time type of things. But it's in the seeking and the finding. You know, God describes himself and his holiness in threes. Son of David, son of man, son of God, the attributes of one eternal, existent, almighty God. He is priest, king, and judge. He was and is and is to come. Those distinctions signal the holiness of God's person. Well, you know, he who was and is and is to come was, he was, all right. I just described the Bible as being one-third doctrinal, one-third historical, one-third prophetic. Was, that's history. Because you have to have a foundation in truth. Those things have to matter. So the genealogies and the book of Genesis, notably in the Chronicles of the Kings and so forth, uh, that's the history. That's the was aspect of God's almighty nature. The is aspect, the right now aspect of God's nature, for he was and is and is to come it, simultaneously at all points of time, so he always is right now. The is portion of that is doctrine. That's what you need right now. Those things that provide the way, those things that we hold to, those things that teach us the way of life, that's the is portion of Scripture. And then the is to come is the prophecy portion of Scripture. God has apportioned his word in thirds to speak of that which was and is and is to come. That thought occurred to me and I thought, holy smokes, amen. Amen. Holy smoke upon the mountain of God. Of course it's outlined as one-third prophetic, one-third one history, one-third doctrine, because that reflects what was and is and is to come. Now, I didn't deduce that by some great intellect. It's very simple. You all get it. You, you got it as soon as I said it. Amen. It's just a simple way that God reflects his holiness and apportions his word and puts it out there for us for all to behold. That's the wonder of the almighty God who was and is and is to come. That's perfect. That, that's just a, that's a, I marvel at it. It's a perfect work. 
And the spirit of it, it's just there. It's always been there. It's in the Isaiah 42, 9 principle that new things I declare. Just, just small little encouragements like that along the way. Small matters of revelation. There's really nothing small when it comes to revelation. It's all big because it's all the strength of Almighty God. But uh, new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you about them. That's the testimony of Jesus. And the Bible gives us ample evidence of that, the foretellings of the birth of the Messiah, the Micah 5-2 promise come to pass. As, as a, a, a point of fact, the very first prophecy ever given in Scripture, which is of the Messiah, which is Genesis 3:15, is about that very subject, about the birth of Christ. So from the very beginning, it was all there. It was all put into place, written, uh, the starry witness, the firmament above of the second heavens, it tells us that, the habitation of the sun, the moon, and the stars, but all inspirations, whether they reach us here in the first heavens of our atmosphere here on planet Earth, the second heavens above, the starry witness that we see uh, above us, it's all inspired from the invisible realm. It's all inspired from the third heaven, and now it's in the book. It's in the book. We've got it here. It's written in the book, and that makes it a finished work in God's sight. All right, Luke chapter 6, verse 40. If we love God and we love one another, and we love mercy, and we have a desire to walk humbly, humbly with the Lord, we'll come out on the right side. You'll be there. You'll be there. God will see to the details. Amen. You just follow him in the right spirit, and then the knowledge is forthcoming. All right. Now, in the middle of speaking about both spiritual and physical sight uh, together, because in the previous verse, it's the saying of, can the blind lead the blind? They'll both fall in the ditch. But we read it directly from verse 40. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. That's perfect. That's perfect considerations. Our cross, amen, it's like his, but not above. We're the disciples. We're not above the master. But everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Consider that. Consider that, being perfectly in place. Being part of the family. For is it not written, Psalms 82, verse 6, is it not written in your law, which Jesus used, to confront his accusers? Is it not written in your law, ye are gods, part of the family of Almighty God, not as objects of worship, praise of worship goes to God alone, but we do get to be called the part of the family. We do get to be in a higher place. We do reach a higher point of praise in Jesus. His cross always above ours, but ours is like his. And we have entered into the labors of all those who have come before us. And all souls depend upon Christ's sufferings and labors. That's another irritating point. You know, Brother Branham gets accused of plagiarism at times, you know, that he uh, took this doctrine from somebody else and so forth. You know, I'll bet if you could have been there at the time of Jesus, oh, he's stealing from Moses, you know. You would have... You would have heard, heard this business going on. I, I'm sure the same thing, same kind of stuff got said. We have entered into the labors. I, I have influences. We all have influences. We draw upon one another for light, such as, but the source of all light comes from the Word of God. Amen. All the stuff, you, all the things that people think and, and, and go through. Amen. If it's holy and righteous and true, and if it follows the content and the intent and the spirit of what's delivered in the Word of God, I say yea and amen to it, whether I said it or not. If it's based on the Word of God, that's the standard. So, critics beware. We're on a perfect pathway. <laughs> We're perfectly considered in our deliberations, and everyone that's Perfectly covered by the blood has unending life in the land of no darkness, the land of no more tears, where God's presence is all surrounding, coming at you from every direction. 
all at the same time, there in the Beulah land of the blissful union, of the land of the delightful country, the Hepzibah land. It's the kingdom of no shadows because God's all surrounding light comes up even through the streets of gold, made translucent by the light of God's presence. Where on earth could a shadow abide? The shadow of darkness is departed from us. We're in the light. No more walking through the veil of tears. No more walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Thy rod and thy staff, it's brought us to the place of comfort in Jesus' name. There will be no stain of darkness upon the land where we're bound in Jesus' name. And that is perfect. Amen. So we're going to perfectly stand in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for his word that comes to us. We're going to sing the I Believe chorus. Thank the Lord. I believe that Jesus has rose up from the dead. Yeah. Amen. That's the thing that the world believes the least. That can be true even in houses of worship. Amen. You've got to put your whole self into this word of God. Amen. It's perfectly done. It's perfectly considered. And it leads us to a brighter and a more glorious day in Jesus' name. Amen. So we thank the Lord for that which lifts us up. Thank the Lord for his healing and deliverance. We thank the Lord for the light of the word that shines through a dark day in order that we can redeem our time, make the best use of that which we have, because this is the life that we're given. Whatever uh, years of the span of our lives that God gives us upon this earth, this is the time we have right now. But it's all leading to that time which is prophesied of, yeah. in Jesus' name, to that day of his appearing. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. As we bow our heads and pray, Sister Patty and Sister Mary may play through. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your eternal presence. We thank you for the light that shines, the light that shines all the more because of the darkness of the day. Father, we thank you, Lord, that one day all darkness will be passed away, and there will be light to see by, light in that glorious land of liberty, that place that is higher than I, heaven's table land. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the promise of your word that stands assured. It's not perceived by the will of man, but it comes down from the throne of God inspired from above. Father, we just thank you for that ever abundant mercy that dwells within us and shows us the way that we should go in Jesus' name. And Father, remembering these names that we've mentioned in prayer, Father, you know them. We know you've heard our prayer. For the prayers of the righteous, they rise up there in Revelation 5.8. They rise up into those golden vials, those bowls of remembrance. The sweet savor of those prayers is known yeah. unto you, and you forget not one of them. Yeah. So, Father, we just thank you for deliverance in our day and for your mercy and for your word, thank you, Father, Lord. that shows through all the darkness. Father, for all these precious gifts, we thank you, Father, for the life that's within us and for the gospel that's made complete and perfectly done and perfectly considered in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the great and precious gift. Through the name and faith of Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Well, thank the Lord. Well, if you believe it, sing it right on out. I believe. Amen. Well, I believe that Jesus rose up, rose up from the dead, and I believe he's coming back, coming like he said, and I believe that there's a fountain where the healing waters flow, I believe that there is mercy, mercy with the Lord, I believe that Jesus rose up, rose up from the dead, and I believe he's coming back. Coming like he said, I believe that there's a fountain where the healing water flows. I believe that there is mercy, mercy with the Lord. I believe that Jesus rose up, rose up from the dead. I believe he's coming back. Coming like he said, I believe that there's a fountain where the healing water flows. I believe that there is mercy. 
controversy with the Lord. I believe that Jesus rose up, rose up from the dead. I believe he's coming back. He's coming like he said. I believe that there's a fountain where the healing water flow. I believe that there is mercy, mercy with the Lord. Well, I believe that Jesus rose up, rose up from the dead. And I believe he's coming back. Coming like he said, I believe that there's a fountain where the healing water flows. I believe that there is mercy, mercy with the Lord. Hallelujah. Go to page 43 in your blue book. And let's sing, Greater is he that's within me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Greater is he that's within me. Oh, greater is he that's within me. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. We have overcome. We have overcome. Because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. We have liberty, we have liberty, because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. All things are profitable, all things are possible. Because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. We walk we by faith, faith and not sight. We walk by faith and not sight. Because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. Victory is mine. Yes, victory is mine. Because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. This life is not my own. This life is not my own. Because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. By his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world the lord is my strength the lord is my strength because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world i have my miracle I have my miracle because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. He is my righteousness. He is my righteousness because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. I have been restored I have been restored because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world I defeat every enemy I defeat every enemy because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world my burdens I lay down, my burdens I lay down, because greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. Greater is he that's within me, yes, greater is he that's within me, greater is he that's within me than he that's within me. 